So I'm summarizing here exactly how fight, fright, freeze works. You can reflect on that in your own time so that you can really look at the impact and then teach this to your students. Because remember, your well-being is what we're talking about now. But everything that I'm talking about, you can teach your students. So I've taught this in the four-year-old version, in the 10-year-old version, in the 15-year-old version, in the 40-year-old version. If the more we know about how our brain works, the better we're going to cope. So I'll let you reflect on this in your own time, but it gives a really nice explanation, I hope, that you'll be able to then carry on and teach to your students so they know how their brain works and then remind yourself how your brain works so that you're really returning to nurturing that part uh, of your well-being so that everything else can have that lovely ripple effect. Let's look at breathing. Now, before you go, oh no, she's gonna talk about breathing. Everybody's always talking about breathing and come on, there's gotta be more. I've got more for you, <laughs> but it starts here. So we know from the brain research, we, we look at simple things, I think, as a species and think, oh, that's too easy. There's gotta be, there's gotta be more. Come on, there's gotta be more. And there is more. But you see, if our minds, if our brains are dysregulated, if there's not the right balance of carbon dioxide and oxygen in our brains, we can't think straight. It's as simple as that. We spend our time in the brainstem and the brainstem might take a little wander into the amygdala where fight, flight, freeze happens. But if we stay there and we don't calm ourselves down through our breath, we can't get to the prefrontal cortex where our thinking is, the upstairs brain. So I'm gonna go through a quick breathing technique with you. And there are so many, and here, remember this. You know, so what this brain is explaining, by the way, is the really dark brain is like a brain that is stressed and a brain that is not doing proper breathing. So you know when you're really tense, you tend to breathe shallowly, I know I do, or, hold your breath, suddenly you're thinking, oh my gosh, I'm not breathing. <laughs> I mean, you're breathing, but you're not breathing in a regulated, relaxed way. And what this does within three minutes, you can see that really beautiful, bright brain that's been doing some nice diaphragmatic breathing. The prefrontal cortex is switched on, it's logical, it's calm, it's not catastrophizing. Within three minutes of a dysregulated breath, whether that's a too fast breath, whether that's a holding the breath, or whether that is um, a shallow breath, if it's any of those three things, what that means is the thinking takes a vacation. So we have to regulate first. Well-being starts with knowing how to regulate your breath. It is the only function that we can have this full control of when we're stressed to bring ourselves back to calm so we can think straight. So I'm going to teach you my favourite one because I love it and I've been using it for a very long time and there's some fantastic research that tells us that it has a very similar impact on the brain uh, as many anti-anxiety medications can have. Now, this is not in replacement for that because many um, people need those extra supports in order to manage their anxiety and stress. But we know this has a good solid impact. It's called the 478 breath. Many of you would have already heard about it. I'm gonna take you through it very briefly. But before I do, just remember this. Wellbeing is a personal thing. Breathing techniques are a personal thing. So just because I love this and your next door neighbor might love this and the person sitting next to you might love this, if this one isn't for you, don't use it. <laughs> so find a breathing method that works for you. Because what can happen is you start taking something on and thinking, well, this is meant to be good, this is meant to be good, and give it a go for a while. You've got to give it a good crack before you know whether it's working for you or not. But if you're thinking, nah, this isn't for me, try something else or you'll always be on this treadmill and then you're not going to be looking after yourself. So to do a four, seven, eight breath correctly, we breathe in for four seconds, we hold for seven seconds and then we breathe out through tight pursed lips and you'll see in a moment what that looks like for eight seconds. And then we repeat that two or three times and then have some relaxed breaths in between uh, until we start to feel that relaxed state. Now, we'll talk more about how to really make that change your brain after this. So uh, get comfortable, give yourself a moment to pay attention to how your mind and your body is feeling. And then once you're comfortable, let's begin. 
So we're going to breathe in for four seconds together. Breathing in. Holding. Breathing out. Now, it takes a bit of practice. Uh, it takes some time to get good at holding your breath that long and exhaling that long. I've been doing it for a very, very long time, so it comes very easily to me. But practicing that kind of breath, and then you would take some shallow, some, some usual breaths in between, and then you would repeat it. We'd like to do at least three cycles. Here's the thing, is none of this breathing is going to work if you're only using it when you're stressed. So for a well-being practice to have an impact and really change the neurological pathways, we need to engage in breathing techniques really many times a day. That's the truth of it. So we're not just going to do it, oh, I'm really stressed, I better take some deep breaths. It doesn't work. That's why all the kids that I work with, they're like, oh, don't teach me deep breathing, it doesn't work. Because none of them are practicing it when they're calm. And when we're calm is when we learn <laughs> and, and we can actually take on that new skill. And it's the same for many of the adults with whom I work as well. We don't dedicate that time because we forget, which is why notes really help. Or for me, I take those slow, deep breaths if I'm not in the car with, with our children, if I'm on my own. Every time I reach a red light, I take those slow, deep breaths. And there's so much research emerging that the more time we do that, you may have heard of vagal tone and that vagal nerve that runs all the way through and touches all of our main organs. That nerve, the more we activate it, the calmer we become. So if you're breathing several times a day, slowing down, you're actually strengthening the pathways in your brain to be a calmer person. So that's how we get calmer. We just do calming things again and again and again when we're calm, not just when we need it. And then in that moment when you've got a dysregulated student in front of you or you've just received an email from a parent who's unhappy about something and you've done your very best as always, but they're just not happy and you're carrying this on your shoulders, you can take those deep breaths before you respond to the email or, or whatever. You can take those deep breaths and your brain will go, oh, yep, I know, I know, this is, I know how to do this. And it will work and it will switch your beautiful prefrontal cortex back on, which will take you back to logic. And that logic will tell you not to take that email personally, not to think there's nothing you can do or that it's a disaster, but to keep it clear and go, okay, I'm back in perspective, I can cope with this. So to summarise on the contagion of emotion, this storm's a bit like what it's like, right? Being in a school every day. It's all a bit unpredictable and things are fired at you and there's so many different demands that are competing, um, whether it's a child needing help with their schoolwork or tying their shoelace or because they've had an argument with uh, a friend. Whatever it is, it's ongoing. And of course, with these storms, we feel it, we absorb it and we take it on. So just remember that in your head that you're going to create a buffer. You're just going to create a little space that goes, look, what's happening in front of me is not going to enter into my heart and mind. I'm going to protect myself. I'm going to stay calm. And that is the best thing I can actually do to help this young person in front of me or help this parent and help myself is to just remain calm. Do not take that storm on board. So here's the thing, <laughs> workaholism is kind of a real thing, right? We talked about civilization's disease and I think the really tricky thing, you know, for all of us in the field that we work in with education, you know, we're drawn to it because of our genuine care and our absolute love and passion for what we're doing. And because we're skilled at it, we can find ourselves spending hour upon hour upon hour preparing, working hard, resetting, redoing, rearranging. 
No one really just works those hours that you've got the child in front of you, right? You take it home with you, it's with you on weekends, it's with you on holidays, and it's just not good. <laughs> it, it, something's got to happen, and I know the job is mammoth, and you can't get anything done when you've got real human beings in front of you and you're teaching them and supporting them all day, right? I know there has to be things happening before and afterwards. Uh, <laughs> The thing is, is we can find ourselves in this really fine line because if we look at it, there's the engaged workaholic, um, which is I think what I see most in education, which is, oh yeah, I'm working on this all the time, but I love it. <laughs> I really love what I'm doing because there's so much meaning and purpose. So that one, that engaged workaholism is not as bad. And it, it's, look, there's some interesting research on this, but we know it doesn't have the same uh, impact on our cardiovascular health as a stressed workaholic. A stressed workaholic is, is, I hate doing this, I hate all of this stuff I've got to do, I'm doing far too much and I'm not having fun but it's got to be done. So there's two very different forms of spending many, many hours on work and I work with a lot of educators who actually are okay with that extra time. It's a bit like me with writing books or writing articles. I need to do that once our children are in bed. So all day I'll be working with children and families and educators. I'll then be with my family once I pick the children up. Then when they go to bed, that is actually again when I get my laptop out and write. But that's an engaged experience. It's a form of flow and relaxation I go into. I certainly don't do it every night. But it is, does make my working day an extremely long working day um, when you look at it that way but there's an engagement in it, there's a joy in it, there's a flow in it, so it has a benefit for my well-being. But when that then goes to, oh my goodness, I've got all of these articles or this book is due or that's due, and it's, I start to feel that burning feeling, that's the sign that it's going into that stressed field. And we've gotta be really, really careful about that. So if that's you, be consciously aware of it. I mean, that self-awareness is where any change happens from. And then you go, okay, I've taken on too much. And really for me, I love to complete a task by just letting the task go. <laughs> There are some things, right, that we're asked to do in our jobs, that we're asked to do at work that are really, really hard for us to say no to because we care about them, they matter, but not to the point where it then becomes something that brings you a source of resentment. So be aware. How's it feeling? If you're taking on extra hours to look after your well-being, you need to know, well, is this actually fulfilling for me? And is it manageable? And am I still enjoying my life? And am I still feeling healthy and well? If it's crossed that boundary, maybe it's time to start saying no, or one of my favorite lines, which is, I'd really love to do this. May I just have some time to think about it and look at my schedule? And there are some things I have to do immediately. And look, if I have a phone call about a student that really needs my support for their mental health and well-being. well, I'll prioritise that. But there are other things that will need to wait uh, for me to take care of myself. So make sure you know where your boundaries are because that's crucial for your well-being. And then make sure you're tuning in every day. Ask yourself, what is my state of mind? How am I feeling? Is this fulfilling or is this stressing me out?